Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this lecture. Uh, what I'm going to talk about is analysis of compactness and non-compactness of so-called Sobolev embeddings, which is one of my favorite research topics. But before I go into detail, I would like to show you some basic fundamental ideas behind these mathematical concepts and why they are useful. When we solve a partial differential equation, would we like to ideally have are nice pointwise solutions that satisfy our equation in every single point. However, uh, to directly prove existence of such nice pointwise solutions is often virtually impossible even for fairly simple partial differential equations and plus there are problems that naturally lead to discontinuous solutions. For example, analysis of shock waves. Such and other problems were spotted already at the end of 19th century. And the beginning of the last century saw a major turning point in thinking. Uh, now, the analysis of partial differential equations is usually divided into two big steps. First, we prove so-called existence of weak solutions or generalized solutions, and then we study their regularity. And ideally, at the end, we show that these weak solutions are in fact nice, regular, and satisfy our equation as we, need, as we want. So what are these weak solutions? For simplicity, let's take Poisson's equation, which appears, for example, in electrostatics. This is its classical pointwise formulation, and by multiplying this classical pointwise formulation by a so-called test function, integrating over the underlying domain omega and using the divergence theorem, we end up with this so-called weak formulation. And by comparing this classical and weak formulation, we immediately see two major differences. Whereas the classical formulation requires uh, you to have derivatives of second order, and these derivatives need to exist in every single point of our underlying domain omega. The weak formulation, on the other hand, requires only existence of first order derivatives, and plus, they don't need to exist in every single point of our underlying domain, but they only need to exist in a weaker sense, which makes this integral meaningful. And as you probably know, there are, loosely speaking, far more functions that you can integrate than that you can differentiate which means, from the mathematical point of view, this gives us much more tools we can work with to prove existence of such weak solutions. And in modern mathematical language, we say that the U of potential solution belongs to a suitable Sobolev space. So what are Sobolev spaces? We need to start with Lebesgue spaces. Lebesgue spaces measure integrability of functions. And assuming here and for the rest of this talk that our om domain omega is bounded, the bigger the exponent p, the better integrability of our function. Sobolev spaces, on the other hand, measure integrability of derivatives of our function. A function belongs to a Sobolev sp LP space if their derivatives are uh, p ex uh, integrable. And so both spaces are very important with the mathematical analysis, analysis of partial differential equations or calculus of variations, and what makes them particularly useful are so-called Sobolev embeddings and their properties such as compactness. So what are Sobolev embeddings? You can think of a Sobolev embedding as a certain trait. We trade uh, information about regularity of derivatives to for better information about regularity of the function itself. This is the, probably the most classical example of a Sobolev embedding, which tells us that if we know that our derivative is p derivatives of our function are p integrable, the function itself is q integrable. And we, and we can take this q up to this p star exponent, which is so-called Sobolev exponent. And what's important here is that this p star exponent is actually greater than the initial value of p. So we basically gained some regularity here. And this is the general idea behind Sobolev embeddings, that they model a certain transfer of regularity. We transfer regularity of derivatives to regularity of the function itself. And this is particularly useful in analysis of partial differential equations or calculus of variations, because at the beginning, we have some initial a priori information about derivatives of our potential solution. And Sobolev embeddings enables us to transfer this initial a priori information to some useful information about the solution itself, and then we can work with it. 
And very broadly speaking, Sobolev embeddings means that if we know that derivatives of our function belong to some function space, then the function itself belongs to another function space, preferably, in a sense, better function space. And what are function spaces? Function spaces are classes, families of functions that share some common properties. For example, weak differentiability and some quality of the integrability of derivatives. That's the case in Sob with Sobolev spaces. An important property of Sobolev embeddings is their compactness. You probably know a compactness theorem. You have probably heard that every bounded sequence of real numbers contains a subsequence that converges somewhere, that converges to some number. And these Sobolev compactness theorems are just much more involved version of such a compactness theorems. This is probably the most, one of the most classical formulations of Sobolev compactness theorem, so-called relic kondrashov theorem, and it tells us that if we have a sequence of functions that are bounded in Sobolev LP space, then we can subtract a subsequence that converge in LQ space. And we can take this Q up to this uh, Sobolev exponent P star, but we, we have to exclude it. Uh, the reason why we have to exclude it is that the so-called optimal Sobolev embedding, then, excuse me, the, where Q is equal P star, is not compact. And that's something I would like to talk in more detail soon. And where you can see these various compactness arguments being used is, for example, analysis of partial differential equations or calculus of variation, especially when dealing with nonlinear problems, because what's often done at the beginning, we prove existence of certain approximate solutions to, to, ap to appropriate suitable, easier approximate problems. And once we have these approximate solutions, we somehow need to justify that these approximate solutions converge to the actual solution of, of the initial problem. And that's where various compactness arguments are often used. And that brings me to the topic I would like to talk in more detail and show you some results from my research, and that's analysis of non-compactness. There are different types of questions that are being studied with respect to compactness of Sobolev embeddings. So far, we have seen sort of yes or no questions, whether a given Sobolev embedding was or not compact. And the an answer to such a question is obviously yes or no. However, sometimes we need more information. For example, if we have a non-compact Sobolev embedding, we might need to know how much, in a sense, this Sobolev embedding is non-compact. Because if we have enough extra information about the structure of non-compactness of our Sobolev embedding, it can sometimes help us to get us around this obstacle, this lack of compactness. There are some standard techniques, for example, as concentration, con uh, concentration compactness principle or profile decomposition techniques that are sometimes successfully used to get us around lack of compactness. Before, okay, uh, excuse me, there are several ways of uh, measuring uh, the severity of non-compactness of a Sobolev embedding. One of them is sort of geometrical, it's so-called measure of non-compactness, which is sometimes attributed to Kuratowski. It's the same Kuratowski you might know for his characterization of planar graphs. And this measure of non-compactness is particularly useful in fixed-point theory and fixed-point arguments, which are sometimes used for proving existence of solutions to nonlinear problems. And uh, this measure of non-compactness gives us a certain scale, which, which measures severity of non-compactness. Our embedding, or more generally bounded linear operator between Banach spaces, is compact if and only if the measure of non-compactness is zero. And the bigger the measure of non-compactness gets, the embedding, the operator, is in a sense worse. It's more non-compact. And the worst possible case is when the measure of non-compactness coincides with the norm of the operator, the norm of the embedding. Another point of view is sort of from the perspective of operator theory. Compact operators, compact embeddings, have a lot of nice properties. Maybe most importantly, they, loosely speaking, transfer infinite dimensional problems, which often appears in analysis of partial differential equations or variational problems, to finite dimensional problems. And we humans, of course, love working with finite dimensional problems because, after all, we live in a finite dimensional world. Merely bounded operators, on the other hand, don't have such nice properties. 
However, there are various classes of operators somewhere between bounded operators and compact operators. For example, strictly singular operators or finitely strictly singular operators. And these various classes of operators are particularly useful in the perturbation theory. And before I show you uh, some results from my, uh, from my research, I need to introduce one more, another concept, the last one, before I show you some results. And that's, um, that's when we measure integrability of functions, uh, the scale of Lebesgue spaces is sometimes not fine-grained enough because we sometimes need to capture more delicate properties of integrability of functions in, in a more refined scale somehow. And there are several, pro, va, va, there are various uh, versions of, there are various, um, excuse me, there are a large number of different function spaces that measures integrability of functions in a more refined way de, than Lebesgue spaces. And one such possibility of use are so-called Lorentz spaces. You can think of Lorentz spaces this way. If we start with one dimensional scale of Lebesgue spaces, Lorentz spaces give us two-dimensional scale of function spaces, which measure, as you can imagine, instead of measuring integrability of function with a one-dimensional scale, we measure it with two-dimensional scale. It gives us a much more refined way of measuring integrability. We can capture more delicate properties of our functions in a more refined way. And with use of, with use of these Lorentz spaces, the optimal Sobolev Lebesgue embedding can be actually improved to so-called optimal Sobolev Lorentz embedding and this uh, Sobolev Lorentz embedding gives us more information about uh, the integrability of Sobolev functions because functions from this Lorentz space have better integrability properties that, than functions from this Lebesgue space. And this brings me to the to actual result from my research. Uh, these are some of my papers that deal directly with Sobolev spaces. Obviously, I'm not going to talk about everything. Instead, I would like to just show you a few recent selected results from my research. Um, both optimal Sobolev Lebesgue and optimal Sobolev Lorentz embedding are well known to be non-compact. Actually, their measure of non-compactness is also well known. It was shown by Hensel uh, that uh, the measure of non-compactness of the optimal Sobolev Lebesgue embedding is the worst possible. It coincides with its norm. And later, it was shown by Bochala that also the optimal Sobolev Lebesgue embedding has the worst possible measure of non-compactness. However, their result left completely open, their result, even their approaches to the problem, left completely open the question whether one of these Sobolev embeddings have better properties, for example, from the point of view of operator theory. For example, whether one of them is strictly singular. We decided to solve this problem with Lang from Ohio State University while I was visiting him two years ago. And I have to say that initially we were skeptical because there are some other results that somehow indicates that non-compact optimal Sobolev embeddings are, in a sense, always maximally non-compact. Their structure of the non-compactness is always the worst possible. Nevertheless, to our own surprise, and I that to say after a lot of work, we were able to show that there is a substantial difference between these two embeddings. Whereas the optimal Sobolev Lorentz embedding is not strictly singular, which is something we kind of expected at the beginning. The optimal Sobolev Lebesgue embedding is not only strictly singular, but in fact finitely strictly singular. And moreover, we were able to show um, uh, excuse me, uh, not approximate, but asymptotic, asymptotic behavior of so-called Bernstein numbers of these embeddings. What are Bernstein numbers? You might know singular values of matrices. And singular values of matrices can be fairly straightforwardly extended to singular values of general, for general operators acting bet between Hilbert spaces. However, in analysis of partial differential equations or calculus of variations, especially with nonlinear problems, we often need to work with general Banach spaces. And in this, the case of general Banach spaces, there is not one unique meaningful way of defining singular values. Instead, there are several meaningful ways which are in general non-equivalent. And these Bernstein numbers are one such possibility. Uh, so far, we have seen so-called sublimiting Sobolev embeddings. Why sub sublimiting? Uh, 
when we work with functions, what we often like to have are bounded functions, because bounded functions somehow usually makes our life e easier. So that's, there is a natural question whether Sobolev functions are necessarily bounded. And the answer is well known to be no, if p is less than n, the dimension of the ambient space, and the answer is well known to be yes, if p is greater than n, the dimension of the ambient space. The case when p equals n is, in a sense, borderline, limiting. It's well known that functions from this limiting Sobolev space, when p equals n, uh, need not be bounded, but they are, in a sense, close to bounded functions. They are so-called exponentially integrable. And this exponential integrability of these limiting Sobolev functions can be captured by this so-called optimal limiting Sobolev embedding, which, uh, which captures uh, this exponential integrability in a delicate way. And this function space on the right-hand side is so-called brazis wenger space, which measures integrability, exponential integrability of functions in a very fine-grained way. It's well known that the... Uh, the, this optimal limiting Sobolev embedding is not compact. However, the measure of non-compactness of this optimal limiting Sobolev embedding was an open problem. The reason is that the techniques that were successfully used before are, be, are completely useless in this case. Uh, there are several reasons why, but maybe most importantly, loosely speaking, the geometry of this brazis wenger space is much worse than the geometry of the spaces we saw before. We decided to solve this problem with Lunk and Pig, and after a, roughly a year of work, we were able to solve it. Actually, we um, developed a certain very general method for establishing clover bounds for measure of non-compactness in a very general setting. Whenever our operator in question or our embedding has certain concentration a certain concentration phenomenon, which is the usual case with non-compact Sobolev embeddings. Using this general approach and after some extra work, we were able to show that the measure of non-compactness of this optimal, Sobolev, uh, optimal limiting Sobolev embedding is the worst possible. And in fact, we were also able to show that the, uh, this optimal limiting Sobolev embedding is not strictly singular, but that requires other techniques and considerations, and that doesn't follow from this general approach. And just a side note, uh, we got the message, we got a message from the editor that this, the paper where these um, results are, pub are presented was, was accepted for publication just last week, so it's a really recent result. And now, uh, in the end, I would like to just very briefly show you different types of topics, problems that are studied with respect to compactness of Sobolev embeddings. There is a certain very general class of function spaces that somehow provides unifying theory for measuring integrability of functions, so-called regiment invariant function spaces. And Sobolev spaces, Sobolev embeddings, and their properties such as compactness are often studied in this very general class of function spaces because it provides certain unifying theory for, for these Sobolev embeddings. And questions like optimal transfer or regularity or optimal compactness results are often studied in this setting. And there is one problem with Sobolev functions. Sobolev functions are not defined pointwise, which means it's not obvious what, what are restrictions of Sobolev functions on two subsets. Whether, loosely speaking, whether Sobolev functions leave traces on subsets. And of course, we want to talk about restrictions, about traces on subsets, because we want to solve problems with prescribed values. For example, boundary value problems. And uh, the compactness of so-called this, is, this problem is often solved by use of so-called Sobolev trace operators, and Sobolev trace operators provide Sobolev trace embeddings, and their properties such as compactness are studied. But the, the knowledge of compact, Sobolev, compactness for Sobolev trace embedding in the general setting of RI spaces was quite limited. And 
we fill this gap with my colleague from University of Salerno, uh, Paula Cavalier, in a series of two papers. There is a certain roadmap of, I would say, the state of art knowledge about compactness of Sobolev embeddings in the general setting of RI spaces. Initially, there were three groups working more or less independently on problem characterizing standard non-trace compactness of standard non-trace Sobolev embeddings in the general setting of RI spaces. The best possible solution was given by Kerman and Peck, and later, later this, uh, these uh, results were extended in two independent directions. One of them is Paula's and mine, and our concern uh, was compactness of Sobolev trace embeddings. First, we did it for traces on affine subspaces, and later we improved our result for characterizing compactness of Sobolev trace embeddings into very general sets equipped, equipped with so-called upper R force measures which, for example, includes even fractal sets with non-integer dimension. And basically, this completely solves the problem of characterizing uh, Sobolev trace, compactness of Sobolev trace embeddings in the general setting of RI spaces. And now, at the end, on a lighter note, I would like to point out that while I was preparing this presentation, I found out that apparently compactness is not important only for mathematicians, but even people interested in soccer and, and the tactics of the game are interested in compactness. There is a widely discussed strategy of compact, def defensive strategy of compactness where the defending team is trying to cover the defensive zone in a compact way so that wherever the ball goes, there is someone from the defending team close to the attacker. And actually, to some extent, it's very close to the notion of compactness from the mathematical point of view. And finally, uh, just to broadly reiterate, to summarize why we care about analysis of non-compactness, for example, various phenomena from the world around us are described by partial differential equations or variational problems, and mathematics in general gives us a lot of tools to analyze these problems. However, nothing is for free, and the price we usually pay here is that we need to deal with infinite dimensional function spaces. And compactness is much less common in infinite dimensional spaces, which means we need to understand the structure of non compactness so we can somehow navigate around this obstacle. And with that, I thank you for your attention. Uh, Thank you for your lecture, uh, introducing the topic, which is usually quite clear just to mathematicians. And thank you for this final example, trying to, uh, to, to explain for non-mathematicians. And now I open the discussion, uh, general discussion to the audience. Uh, Professor Křížek. Uh, oh, thank you very much for your nice lecture. Uh, in solving real-life technical problems, we usually have mixed boundary conditions, yes? Have you also some results uh, where, for instance, the Dirichlet type of boundary condition changes into another type because at these points are usually singularities and, and things like that, so... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, thank you for your very uh, good question. Unfortunately, the answer is no, because the problem is already very difficult and technical with zero boundary condition and once you get more complicated boundary conditions it's i mean maybe in 20 years we have something <laughs> thank you professor Zelezny. yes could you uh, list some uh, downstream fields that uh, receive impact from your research like uh, in technology or electrical engineering perhaps uh, I mean, in technology, my research is about analysis of partial differential equations and mathematical tools for analyzing of them. So basically, where, wherever po partial differential equations are used, there is a chance that some results are used. But I can mention one particular uh, result, but not in technology, still from a mathematical point of view. Uh, one of my papers with Lang and David Edmunds, who's from Brighton, it's not, I didn't present this result here, but it was part of my habilitation thesis. Uh, it got uh, cited in Mathematician Annalen just a couple of months ago, 
and they used some results from this, our paper to analysis of some, it was semilinear heat equation where they studied some physical semilinear heat equation, some weak solution, some um, physical solutions to, uh, to nonlinear semi-heat uh, equation and they somehow analyzed the properties of this solution. Thank you. Do we have any other questions? Uh, Professor Křížek. So, at the beginning of your lecture, you showed us that the exponent p is less than infinity, yes? Mm -hmm. But later you showed some L infinity spaces. Are these spaces separable or not? No, they are not. Okay. That's one of the th things that makes it so difficult. <laughs> Thank you. So, any other questions? So, if not, I would like to thank you, the presenter, for the lecture, the audience for, for questions. And the habilitation procedure will continue in a few minutes, in five minutes, in meeting room number 80 in the ground floor. And I would like to ask uh, uh, habilitation committee, uh, Professor Křížek and the candidate to join us. And this closes the session.